everybody. Oh, great. The video's working. The video is working. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Winston. Hi. Hi, and here's Aida. Perfect. Hi. Hello, Aida. Hello, Dr. Winston. So good to see you again. Sorry, I've been, um, the Zoom has been throwing me out, Michelle. I think I've been Same bumping. Thing. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We have to figure that out. It just says I'm about to leave and then you popped on and now we're all here. So I'm so excited. So excited. <laughs> well, I have to say I'm a little anxious because I don't know what we're going to talk about. But oh, you're on the right call then. <laughs> <laughs> you see, anxiety sometimes can be a good thing, right? Well, yeah, it's really more excitement, I think, than anxiety. But, you know, when you don't know what's going to happen, you just always of have course. to. Yeah. Of course, we always invite those people. Would you come on our webinar, please? They have no idea what we're up to, <laughs> how we do it. <laughs> of course. Right. Hi, yeah. everybody. And, and no, ma no matter how many times you do it. You still have that little blip right before. Yes, yes. But it's a yeah. good thing. Yeah. Now, do I get to see the people who are who are um, listening or or not? You can see them in the chat. If you open the chat window, yeah, bottom, you can see, bottom row um, the, chat. the text. You can't see the faces, but you can okay, see. Just the text. And if people type in chats, um, I have a whole bunch of questions that were printed out that I marked off all the ones about thoughts, but... Um, oh yeah, we already have 85 people so far. We have almost, yeah. at least 300 people registered for this webinar. Oh, is that Everybody. is that common about the usual number? It's all because of you. It's all Dr. because Wayne. of you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's so good to have this webinar with Dr. Winston. Tell us where you are from. Uh, you know, some people are already used to. They know we ask this question where right you're away. From, I see all, right. all the different yeah, Estonia, Baltimore, U.S. Wow, wonderful, wonderful, excellent. And cool. so, who so, knows, Dr. Winston already? She's kind of a woman who doesn't need much of an introduction on our calls. But oh, from yeah. Nigeria, hello. Hi, I read your books, Dr. Sally. Wonderful from UK. Uh, but Dr. Dr. Winston, sorry, we, we said Dr. Sally all the time. Is that is that okay for you? I don't care what you call me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> would you would you mind introducing yourself for our uh, members? Okay, I'm uh, Dr. Sally Winston. I'm a I'm a psychologist. Um, I live in Baltimore, although I am Canadian. I'm originally from Montreal. And um, I have been in the field since before probably most of your people who are in, the, in this uh, were born. <laughs> but um, I've been working in anxiety disorders and OCD since the uh, 70s. And um, I, I run a, a big group called the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland, which started as part of Shepherd Pratt Hospital in Baltimore. Um, in 1978, and then we became independent in 1992. There are 25 therapists, various training things we do. Um, so it's developed over the years. And recently, I started writing books with my good friend, Dr. Marty Seif, uh, who lives in uh, Connecticut. And, um, and well, anybody well, recognize this book? This yes, is, yeah. I actually Oh, have you got yours too. <laughs> Where's yours? <laughs> <laughs> I do have one. Here we go. That's one. That's number one. Well, that's actually number two. That's number three. And that's the one that just came out a few days ago. Brand new book, Overcoming Anticipatory Anxiety. And the other one was Needing to Know for Sure. Right. All things we talk about all the time here on the webinars. And I that title, it. the title just like it, it hit home, right? Needing to know for sure. That applies to all forms of anxiety, right? Uncertainty, needing to know for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm definitely very excited to read, to read that book. You guys, um, we will link later all of Dr. Sally's books with a link so you can go and purchase them on Amazon, I suppose. You can buy them Amazon, Barnes & Noble, sort of anywhere. Okay. They're all new Harbinger books. Great. Okay. Do you also do audiobooks, Dr. Sally? Pardon me? Do you also record audiobooks? Um, I, don't I don't record them myself. The first two seem to have turned into audiobooks. 
Um, the third one, not not yet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who manages all that stuff. <laughs> I don't know who does this. <laughs> <laughs> the same way with the foreign the the foreign translations. I have no control over that. I don't even know <laughs> about them. I find out randomly. One of my staff members is Chinese, and she was looking around for something and discovered a Chinese translation of the book. Oh, surprise! Which, and that was the only way I found out about it. Yeah. You, you, it's just all over the place, apparently. And for anybody who doesn't know Dr. Winston, we, it is completely along the lines of D.A.R.E. And I, I marked a couple of quotes from this blue book that I just wanted to, to read out loud before we get started. These, this is from your book. Thoughts stick because of the energy you expend to fight them. And anybody who's on here, there's over like 100 people now. Let me know if you've heard us say some version of this before. So again, thoughts stick because of the energy you expend to fight them. Okay, here goes the chat. Um, here's another one. Most of your distress is caused not by what you think or feel, but how you feel about and react to what you think or feel, right? You'll hear me say, it's how you treat how you feel. It's how you treat your thoughts. Um, and here is what I think is like the crux of the book. You can't make your thoughts go away at will. You can focus your attention on certain thoughts, but that doesn't mean you have the capacity to make them go away. Um, and that's, that's usually when I'll do, where is it? I'll hold up something like this and I'll say, here's thoughts I like, and here's thoughts I don't like. And really it's, this is the problem mm -hmm. where I decide to shine my light and, and pay attention. Um, and so this is coming right out of your book. And one more I wanted to read, accept and allow is more of an attitude than a technique. And that, that is really where we correlate here. Because again, when, when I always, we always tell people, don't get lost in the steps. How do I diffuse? How do I, what do I do about these thoughts? You're not doing anything about the thoughts. Mm -hmm. You're doing work on how you treat the thoughts. And so accept and allow, like you'll hear us say a lot, it's a shift in a mindset on how I treat the presence of thoughts. It's not a technique. It's not doing it all the right way. It's kind of learning a new attitude. Um, so I wanted to just pull a few quotes from your book to show how in line all of this work is. Right. And, and it, it really is the, you know, stems from the early work of Claire Weeks, who had a completely different idea from the, the zeitgeist at the time in the 60s, which was change your thoughts and that will mm -hmm. change how you feel, which frankly doesn't work. Um, right. So it's, it, it's really the difference between um, um, anxiety management, um, um, self-regulation, control, all of those things, fix this with that. Frankly, it just doesn't work, which is why we felt like we had to write this book, because there are many, many people who misunderstand what they're doing and, and apply, they want coping skills, meaning I want techniques of things to do to change what's going on. And if that worked, great, but it doesn't work. So it's really, it's really exactly that's the crux of what you pulled out of the book, which is that it is about a different relationship with the content of your mind. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sally. That's it, right? Oh, I'm so, going to be nodding this whole webinar. Yes, right? So you have an unpleasant thought. So you either now can try to find a technique so you can change the thought to alleviate your anxiety, or you change your relationship to the thought and how the thought affects you. And we talk a lot about cognitive diffusion and use different analogies and videos to, to show people that they are not their thoughts. Thoughts are like partials on an assembly line or, you know, all these different analogies we use. But I have found, and maybe you can attest to that, that people have the hardest time really believing that they are not the products of their mind. Right, right. And there's also the problem of having, having this notion of there are techniques to diffuse and therefore I need to do the diffuse thing so it'll work. And then what happens is you spend part of your time doing the technique and part of your time checking to see if that's working mm -hmm. to make your thoughts go away or to make you feel better. And all of that is just part of fighting. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. work is such a big word. It's like, well, I tried this. I read this book, but it didn't work. It didn't Dare doesn't work. work. That's like, what are you trying to do? 
Right. The interpretation of what work means is really yes. very important mm -hmm. because as Claire Weeks said, recovery is not when you don't have symptoms. It's when the symptoms don't matter. Yes. Yes. Right? So it's, have it's a completely different orientation. And the fact is that people, you know, the, the whole notion of effort is really important to understand, you know, in the outside world, well, you know, if you want to get something accomplished, you put in effort. If I want to move a table, I put in effort, I push the table, the table moves. That's how it works in the outside world. In the inside world, it doesn't work like that. In the inside world, the more effort you put in, the more backwards you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more stuck you get and the more involved you get in thinking that effort is needed. And yes. it just turns, it, it's just the inside world and the outside world are just different. Yeah. And for you our know, dare people, this is when we say things that are actionable and things that are noticeable. And you take action against things that are actionable. But when you take action against things that are noticeable, you just notice more of it because it's being treated as a threat. And so it's learning how to go back to like observer mode. A few people posted CBT, CBT. I mean, it says CBT based guide, but people are using these techniques the wrong with the wrong intention. And let me just explain a little bit because you're getting to actually talk to the author. It's not up to us when we work with you new harbinger what our title is. Really? We had a huge fight because we didn't want CBT in the title because it's not standard CBT. It's not. And so we got them to say CBT based. CBT informed, CBT ish. Mm -hmm. ish. It's, not, <laughs> it's not CBT. And the reason that they insist on it is that's a key word on Amazon. And if you don't put in CBT, you don't get noticed. Hmm. So, you know, that it's unfortunate. And we, unfortunately, we are stuck with those words in on the page. But when people open the book and start reading, they can see it's not standard. CBT. It's, right. it, it is really about an attitudinal shift and, and it's not a bunch of techniques. Right. Right. And, and if we any, ever talk about that sort of thing, it's almost like anybody who's familiar with CBT, it's almost like using that kind of approach to direct the story about your thoughts rather than to directly change your thoughts. Like on, on dare advanced call, I had all a bunch of anybody, my dare advanced people here, who was on my call yes, um, on Thursday, we had a whole bunch of post-its here. I'm like, view it as like a, you know, when you did like a word bank in school and you got to pick the words from the word bank and you pick the ones that were useful to write a story and you can pick, you had to pick like a certain amount, but you can always keep using the same words over and over again. It's not to take out a thought and replace it with the good one. It's focus and use the ones that are more useful for what you need to be used right now. They, they belong, your thoughts belong in your brain, just like the li the books belong in the library. It's just, it's really a matter of focus, attention, time, the involvement we get in the thoughts and the label we attach to them that becomes the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. CBT. All right. So somebody asked, what is CBT? Cognitive behavioral therapy. It's at this point, it's a kind of a meaningless term because second wave, third wave, mm -hmm. CBT-ish, metacognitive is really the word that, that describes better the kind of work that we're doing. It's more mm -hmm. metacognitive. It's about being aware of and dealing with your experience of your thoughts, not your thoughts. So. Absolutely. Cool. So um, we have a great question in the chat. And if you don't mind, I would love to start with that question because it's, it's an all time favorite and something that everybody experiences. And that is rumination. Dr. Sally, would you, would you mind sharing a little bit uh, about your take on rumination? Why does it happen? Why do we do it? Uh, what, what do we think we get from it and how can we let go of it? Yeah, well, rumination is voluntary which people don't think that's true because it feels like you're stuck. Mm -hmm. But when you think about the, the word obsessing, they use it all wrong. Um, and obsessing and ruminating get used the same way. That's right, yeah. Rumination is all the thinking that you're doing to try to make your anxiety go away. Mm -hmm. 
So you have a, a thought that raises anxiety, and this is the structure of both generalized anxiety and OCD, is that a thought comes in from somewhere who knows it doesn't matter, and it makes you anxious or disgusted or ashamed or upset or angry or something, some mm -hmm. feeling you don't want to have. And then you launch into an effort to make that feeling go away. And that's usually with some form of self-talk. Sometimes it's avoidance. Sometimes it's planning of something to avoid. But usually it's some form of self-talk to try to convince yourself that the thing shouldn't make you anxious or it's not going to happen or whatever you want to do to try and make that feeling go away. That's rumination. And rumination is falsely valued because it's, it's undertaken to try to help, mm -hmm. but yes. it doesn't work. What happens is it gives credence to the thought. It makes the thought seem important. It makes the thought seem like it's worthy of working on. It makes the thought seem like maybe a red flag or something that you got to do something about it makes the thought too important. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you convince yourself that you have to think about it some more. Let's be clear, you don't solve too much thinking with more thinking. That's, that's not it. It's like being, you know, like being in a hole and, and all you got is a shovel. You don't keep shoveling. Yeah, that was one of our posts. I think you don't spend, you don't get out of your head by spending more time in your head trying to figure out how to get out of your head. Exactly. And, and you so, know, Dr. Sally, well, sorry, well, sorry if I may just interrupt you a second because yeah. I love that so much from your book. The detail in your book, I've never seen it somewhere else. And that was the part where you start to reason with your thoughts. So it doesn't, doesn't even feel like you're trying to give it importance, but you're doing it. Yeah, you're trying in a very subtle way. Right. And that's why we have the three, the three voices of the mind, because they illustrate that process, which just seems so completely natural, which is, and it's false comfort that is holding the rumination. It's, it's an attempt to feel better that just completely backfires by making what ver worried voice had to say something that you have to address. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a hook. So it seems like you have an irrational mind and then you're trying to, to apply a rational mind to, to fix it. And all that happens is a big battle that makes you more agitated and more upset. And it just reinforces and makes your mind stickier and it makes the thoughts stick more. And so that's, that is what rumination is. And the, and the ideas don't do that. Now, when we're talking about very well practiced habits of the mind, of course, when you have an upsetting thought, the first thing that happens, and it happens so automatically, it feels like you're not doing it, but you are doing it. Mm -hmm. But you have some kind of disputation of that thought, or some kind of comfort around that thought, or even the labeling of the thought can be done in a manner that's rumination. Mm -hmm. Yes, with a wrong intention, right? When you right. put a condition on what you're doing. Same as you said, I'm trying to diffuse with the condition that the thought will then go away, right, allowing right, right. and diffusing with, with conditions. Yeah. Right, so right. subtle though sometimes. It's so <laughs> subtle. And that's where all the change is. That was our post today, guys. Did you see that one? Um, ignoring versus allowing. And ignoring means does not, I can't remember the exact words, but like like will not acknowledge the presence of and allowing is like, uh, you know, giving permission for something to be there. Neither way, you don't get to determine the presence of what's present. It's here, whether you like it or not. But all of this happens in between you and the thoughts. If you treat this thought as danger. And so we're, that's why we're changing the part in between. So I was saying, oh, I have all these thoughts. I feel guilty for having them. And so that's why debunking, you debunked all these myths in your book of like, well, that's, that's, that's what you have to do in order to get the attitude that it's okay for them to be there. Right. Because, you know, somebody uh, wrote me an email uh, this morning saying, you know, that I've had some contact with by email in the past saying, please address um, me uh, meta thoughts, you know, 
and their thoughts about thoughts. And I think this, the same thing happens. If you, if you believe the presence of a thought indicates that either it's, there's danger coming or you, you're a bad person if you think it or it's meaningful about something else, mm-hmm. get all involved in, in misunderstanding of what mm-hmm. thoughts mean then you end up having meta thoughts that can then get stuck and be in, in, you know, in stuck thoughts too. And they can be just as obsessional and just as um, unpleasant and just as stuck. So the thoughts about thoughts have to be addressed too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, 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 right. Cause again, you're going to be focusing on what, whatever you shine your light on and your focus on is what you deem as most important. And that's the paradox because well, the goal is unimportance. <laughs> yeah, but there's, you know, there is a piece of this it's very, that is, is an important point to make, which is they are, they are not random what gets stuck. Mm-hmm. Right? When you say meaningless, you're not saying random. Why they get stuck is that you fight them. Right. So yeah. we don't tend to have stuck thoughts about chairs. We have stuck thoughts about things we definitely don't want to think about, like violence, suicide, pedophilia, you know, bad things, uh, crises, Mm -hmm. you know, death of our children, whatever it is. These are the things that get stuck. So while they are meaningless in the sense that it doesn't mean that you wish for that to happen or you hope for that to happen or that it's even likely that it's going to happen. It got stuck because it was important to you right. in some way, but and it's, the opposite. Values. Yeah. it's yeah. the opposite of you. Mm-hmm. So that a person who is afraid of harming a child because they have this thought that they could harm it. What if I harm a child? What that means is something very simple, which is that you love children. And it's a horrible. Yeah. Thing. Here's this thought. I don't like the thought. I fight the thought. The fight right. is where the anxiety right. is created. And I need to get rid of this thought to get rid of anxiety. That's right. most people's approach that gets you stuck. Right. It's like, I don't need to get rid of the thought. I just notice I had the thought and it's the getting rid of that. Right. It's the getting rid of. We're trying to get rid of people fight all the time. The, the notion of it's meaningless because it's not random. It right. is. <laughs> but it's the meaning is obvious it's just the opposite of you uh you know and that's that you know right. people people who uh you know there's a there's a, a a common thing that happens where people are afraid they're going to blurt out something blasphemous mm-hmm. Into, mm-hmm. You know, or yeah. some terrible racial slur or something inappropriate or do right. something spontaneous right. mm-hmm. you don't see that kind of obsessive stuck thought in an atheist Oh, we use that example a lot. We use right. that example that's all it. the time mm-hmm. right. because it's like, it doesn't go against the grain. It's like, right. oh yeah, I do believe that. And so right. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Right. So, and people who have, who are horrified by the thought that, you know, you know, they could jump off the balcony. Those are people who love life and want to keep living. want to jump off the balcony. Yeah. And so that's, that's, it's not random. Right. Um, right. It's not something that has to be explored. And that's kind of why, how do you feel about the term intrusive thoughts? Because I kind of hate that term. Anybody who knows me on the dare pages, I hate the term because I say a lot. I'm like, listen, they're just spontaneous thoughts. You just don't like, we have spontaneous thoughts we like, but because we don't do anything about them, it's not like, oh, Michelle, I had to book a call with you because I had this random thought of what if I win the lottery? And now I just can't stop thinking about how rich I'm going to be. Mm-hmm. nobody ever they call me for the shitty shit thoughts of the stuff they don't like and they don't want I'm like they're really no different they've just become like illuminated thoughts they're the thoughts I'm focused on because they're the ones I don't like the most but we have spontaneous thoughts all the time we just get stuck in the ones right. we decided we don't want to have well and that's why the book is called overcoming unwanted intrusive thoughts um you know, everybody has intrusive thoughts. They have thoughts that don't fit in with what they were thinking or they're, they're weird or they're, you know, but if you don't seize on it, if you don't care about it, it passes by, you barely remember had it. So there's passing intrusive thoughts and unwanted intrusive thoughts, and they're completely different experiences. You need to add a few ingredients. I always say to my clients, you can have a thought that you don't like. It's not sticky yet. It starts as a thought you don't like, 
But if you if you fear it, first of all, and then you start to add the second fear, and then you start to avoid it or alleviate the anxiety, the rouge of adrenaline that comes with it, this is when you turn it into a sticky, unwanted, intrusive thought. Exactly. That's a process that we actually can, can change if we believe that our minds are not dangerous right. and that anything can be there and it's not going to suddenly leap out of you and cause you to do something against your will. Right. You know, and and that's the part that people get very stuck in because they're like, well, I, I don't believe this. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it. Like, I don't believe that these thoughts came at, are just spontaneous. Like there's still all this meaning and perception about having a thought I don't like, like, and then it also t- it goes into like, well, well, I'm so anxious. What, what if I, here's the thought that I, I don't want to jump out the window, right? This is the progression of it. I had this thought of what if I jump out the window? And then I call the response, the gasping and clutching of pearls. Cause it's like, <gasps> but I don't want to jump out the window. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, so we try to rationalize. No, Michelle, you don't want to jump out the window. You love your life. You love your family. But what that's if I lose control comfort. and jump out the window? You, like that's always the progression. And so we kind of keep locking into control or better keep an eye on these thoughts because right. if I don't, they're going to take over. And then I do it spontaneously and impulsively. And this right. is a, a very common area where people get locked in. Right. And, and those things that you say to yourself to try to, address the fact of what we call the whoosh, you know, when you have the thought, it comes stuck with this whoosh of Mm -hmm. of affect and arousal. That's all false comfort and engaging in that is the problem, you know, and it's not so much in it's engaging in that why, you know, you can have exactly the same action and have it be completely different. Yes. Let's say you're driving, you're driving in your car and you have a, a bad thought, right? You can reach for the radio and turn it on two entirely different ways. Mm-hmm. It can be maybe if I listen to the radio, I won't think about that thought and I can like flood my mind with the music and the thought will go away. Maybe I can fix it that way turn Mm -hmm. on the radio, or you can be, well, well, one channel of my mind is acting completely nuts. I might as well listen to music. That's a different thing. It looks the same. It's like thought radio, but they are completely different in terms of how they work Mm -hmm. and, and, and what they mean to the person and their, the person's relationship with the thought. I love this webinar. It's important. I can listen to music. You can be there however long you want to be there. You know? Absolutely. Fraction versus engagement, right? Yes. I, and sometimes, and I'm sure you, you get this too a lot, where, where people ask, well, sometimes I'm confused if I'm actually engaging or if I'm distracting. How can I know the difference? And I always tell them, ask yourself, whatever I want to do, is my intention to change the way I feel? or to do it despite the way I feel, right? This is how you know, but sometimes, and I've had this so many times with clients, Dr. Sally, where people say alone, that question, if for which reason I'm doing this becomes an intrusive thought. Right. Right. It's it's again, in order to versus while, right. Mm -hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. it. But then the check, 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 check. Am I doing it right? That's just did it work. And did it work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, right. so, this is, this is I'll awesome. say like, what, or like if what you're doing, like you could, two people could do the same thing. I say, I have people that do really unhealthy things and really healthy things, but two people can be taking a run. But if it's, is it gone yet? Is it gone yet? Is it calm down? Right. That's then the this is still, yeah. yeah, this is still the subject of your actions. Right. Rather than I'm getting involved in running for the sake of getting involved in run, running while the presence of this thought is still allowed to be here. And that's the part I think that a lot of people kind of miss, especially when they get stuck in the CBT mode. But I was supposed to replace this thought with a good thought. No, you right. were supposed or to I'm like so, decide to. Somehow or other, this is supposed to make it go away. Yes. And the right. fact is that it does go away, but it goes away on its own schedule when it's ready. And it, you're, it's not up to you. So right. what happens is that if the thought doesn't matter, then you don't expend energy struggling with it. 
then you stop dreading it. Mm-hmm. Your level of sensitization comes down. The likelihood that it's going to keep recurring goes down just because it doesn't matter. Eventually, it goes away. But it's on. It's not because you made it go away. Yes, because it ran out of fuel. <laughs> so upside down. Yeah, I, I a consequence, right? It's a yeah. consequence of it. Of right. it's not caring. It's a, the idea of achieving a goal passively is so, <laughs> you know, it's so. That, and that's where like it's, people are like, it's like a cross between Eckhart Tolle and Dr. Seuss kind of come together. Cause it's like, like the one, the closest like thing I can think of is like trying to teach. It's like, it's like trying to forget something like mm-hmm. forgetting is a natural process. And so your brain kind of knows what to hang on to and what to let go of by what you pay the most att- attention to. And so you can't make yourself forget. If I don't like the, the toy I got when I was a kid and I'm trying really hard to accept and allow and I keep checking in to see if I forgot, I will never allow the natural process of forgetting. Like you forget because it's unimportant. Right. And that's why we wrote the second book because the second book is about checking compulsion, mm. right? And reassured seeking and the checking compulsion, if it's used as part of your attempt to to work with your uh, intrusive thought, you're going to end up just creating more troubles. I noticed there's a question that says, can you guys answer the questions in the chat as well? Yeah, <laughs> it's, we have we have a, questions that got submitted here and we have some questions in the chat so we can start going through bits and pieces of them. I did see one question in the chat I wanted to answer real quick on, on a, what was it, on reassurance. Did, did you two see that? No, would you mind? I would like to be the first one to ask a personal question to Dr. Sally. <laughs> and everybody can okay. join in. <laughs> I'm going to be here for a while. I'll answer any question. <laughs> so the third step of DARE is the run towards step, where it's basically the paradoxical intention, demanding more of what you're afraid of. And usually with the intrusive thoughts, it's a little bit tricky to do that in the classical way. But I have found... And and this is what I did and what I advise to my clients, but I haven't seen it in a book. So I wanted to know your take on that. When I got really, really annoyed with my intrusive thoughts, but I felt just ignoring them was not enough. Like they kept coming. They didn't decrease. I started to say, oh God, this boring thought again. Oh, come on. That's not scaring me anymore. Can you bring me something that is more scary than this? And then I would wait for 60 seconds and say, so, okay, time is up. Sorry, I got to go. What do you think of that? Well, I think it, it has, it, again, it's the attitude with which you do that that makes the difference, mm-hmm. right? What you were saying, you were finding the words, I think, to express an attitude. And, and by saying those words to yourself, you got yourself into that place where you didn't care whether they were there or not. Exactly. But it's so contradictory, right? Because we we actually tell our clients, look, don't sit there and stare at them and go into details of how you are going to kick children randomly in the street. Just notice, say, "Uh uh-huh, okay. Acknowledge, allow it to be there without dwelling on it, right? Let it pass. Right. I find it a tricky one because people that are often like, well, but I'm not supposed to look at them, but now I'm supposed to demand more of them. But I find it really, really helpful to show your, your anxious mind, look, I'm, I'm getting really bored and bring me some more of these. So it goes with step three of, of dear, but I haven't found it in your book. I wanted to have your opinion. Find their own words for expressing that attitude. And that's, that's wonderful. I think when people find their own way of expressing that attitude, that works because, because what it means is that you're no longer engaging, you know, with the struggle, you're, you're surrendering, you're Mm -hmm. saying, be there. If you're there, I'm, I'm, it, you know, I, I'm going to stop having that tug of war between mm-hmm. my thoughts and me. I'm just going to drop the rope, stop playing, go ahead, do whatever you're going to do. And even make it worse is another way of saying, I'm not scared of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, what she's saying is this, guys, remember this paper that you're tired of? Fighting this is not the problem. This is the problem. And so like, I can go towards it. I can let go of it. This is where we get stuck. The resistance we create towards thoughts. You can sit and get lost in your thoughts. There are plenty of people that have a lot of thoughts they don't like, but they're not doing this while they're experiencing the thoughts. And so it's going from this 
to going to this and letting the thought still be present. Right, right. Again, it's a shift in attitude. There's a, a, a very important question in the chat right now, which is the difference between rumination and obsession. Mm -hmm. Obsession is the, is the thought that makes your anxiety go up and rumination is your attempt to make the anxiety go down. So they are that in every, the what if is the obsession mm -hmm. and the struggle is the rumination. Is that, is that clear? The okay. problem with that word, I think, is people started using that word as like a doing thing and, and combining that uh, I'm obsessing about this. Which is really like, rumination. Correct. Yeah, right. Right. And so like obsessive thoughts are, the, are obsessive thoughts are noticed. Rumination is the action and behaviors that I'm doing in response to the thoughts. Does that make sense, guys? And so, so what happens is this kind of thing. Right. Right. Um, I wanted to answer this. There's so many questions coming up in here now. Um, reassurance really quick. Reassurance doesn't work because it's like, I'm trying to convince myself that I'm safe rather with words and checking to see if it's gone. And so you're sending yourself two different messages and you guys will hear me joke around. You'll notice when you're in reassurance mode, when your voice goes up three octaves and you're like, Okay, you're never gonna murder a village of children. No, 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 you're not gonna do that thing. No, you're not gonna. And then what you're really doing is you're trying to convince yourself that you're fine and that bad thing's not gonna happen. And basically say, now shut up, shut up, alarm, shut up and go away. See, I'm fine. Now stop showing me these thoughts. And it just, even if reassurance from other people, are you sure I'm okay? Are you sure I'm okay? It's great. It works well for like five seconds until you're not sure again and comes uncertainty and doubt and the whole idea is to grow trust back in yourself and so rather than reassuring yourself that you're safe that's when you'll hear us say on all the groups start acting like you're safe how would you be acting if, if you had a thought about having lollipops and orgasms you would be like this you would be checking to see if they're gone your body and your brain would be like mm -hmm. yeah Oh yeah, there's a thought and you would kind of leave it alone. And so, you know, reassurance, if you're doing a lot of work about the presence of something, it's the work that we're focused on. Right. So I hope that clears it up. I hope the that psychological up. principle of why reassurance doesn't work is called negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And um, it, what it does is the temporary relief that comes from it actually works to increase the likelihood that the mm -hmm. thought will come back. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where that, why there's that circle where it goes looping round and round and round because of the negative reinforcement. I always tell my clients instead of when that urge comes to reassure yourself, think of your goal. What is your goal? Make it your goal to, I always say, to discharge the battery. Imagine a thought in that, that whoosh of adrenaline is like a charged battery. It comes together. There's thought and there comes the whoosh. And then I say, if you want to discharge the battery, you need to allow the thought to be here, that whoosh to wash over you and to just let it be. And that way, every time you do that, the battery gets discharged a little bit more until you can have that thought without having the distress signal. And, mm -hmm. But I find that second when the thought comes into your awareness, that first second is so important how you react. The urge will be there to alleviate the feeling, but this is where you need to be strong and say, oh, hold on a second. Right? What is my goal here? Right? Let me do something else. And, and the general principle is sometimes it goes so fast that you screw up and you mm -hmm. reassure yourself. And then what you do is you just notice that you reassured yourself and you reintroduce the thought. Right. So the, the general principle is, O, obsession, C, compulsion, O, obsession, C, always end in O. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I like that. That's always so end with O. O, O. So that if you accidentally compulse <sighs> by reassuring yourself or doing something that's an attempt to make yourself that's feel better. Great. That's a yeah. good one. I like that one. Yeah. And you're sort of mindfully aware that you're doing that. So then you don't do that sort of very automatic split second kind of reassurance. Right. You guys take a note or make, make a mental screenshot. Always end on O, not on, on C. <laughs> That's great. So Dr. Let, sorry, go, I'm ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. 
Uh, I just want to ask you if it will be okay to address uh, the DPDR because there have been a few questions asking that people have read that DPDR can be a habit of thought. And what is your opinion on that? DPDR refers to what? Oh, de derealization depersonalization disorder. Oh, hmm. it's what is the question about it? If it can be a habit of thought. Now, I'm not exactly sure what they're saying, but I think I think I'm, I might know what they mean. Sometimes with DPDR, you when you're engaged in something going about your life and you don't notice you're disconnected, but as soon as you're being reminded of the feeling of detachment, you kind of bring it on. And correct me guys if I'm wrong, but I think that is the question if that is really a thing. Right, well, there, there, uh, the detachment is a, is a complicated thing because it's more than one thing, right? Mm -hmm. There, it, You can feel um, depersonalized and derealized just from hyperventilating. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you're hyperventilated for quite a while, you may not realize you're hyperventilating. You may not be at the point where you've got tingling fingertips, but you can feel that sense of out of body, out of reality, weird stuff. Now, what happens in that quote habit of thought is that if you notice that and you are upset about it mm -hmm. and you try to stop it or you get scared of it, you increase your level of anxiety about it and you keep hyperventilating more and you end up with that. It's also true that you can dissociate from in many different ways. Like, you know, like when you're driving, if you, if you many people have the experience where they suddenly realize that they, you know, they're much further along or they passed their exit or they haven't really been, you know, aware of driving while they're driving. And that's a kind of a hypnotic dissociation, a sort of trancey sort of thing, which is a perfectly normal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And if you react to that, like, hmm, that was interesting. Um, obviously, you kept driving safely while you were sort of out of it. That sort of trance-like phenomenon is normal if you're not worried about it, if you don't right. seize on it, if you don't try to make sure it doesn't happen, then you're fine. But right. if you get all involved and your habit of thought, I guess, is one of the ways of putting it, if you start working on it and trying to not have it happen, then, of course, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're making yourself an anxious. And, of course, the symptoms will start coming. It's just like trying to, you know, tr any it's a paradoxical effect, like, uh, you know, don't don't notice those people talking over there or, or don't notice that the person you're talking to has a piece of spinach in their tooth. I mm -hmm. mean, you can't not notice something that you've noticed. Right. 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 But then you can, you can decide what you do once you've noticed it. And that's, and that's why if anybody's watching this call and they're like, shut up, stop talking about thoughts. I care about my heart palpitations. We're going to have a call next month with Dr. Gupta. Well, and it's going to be geared towards heart palpitations, but it's going to be the same kind of call. Because it's going to be how I treat that I felt disconnected for a minute. Now what? How I treat that thought I didn't like. Now what? How I treat those physical sensations. Now what? So even though the context of this call is based on thoughts, I hope everybody can see the correlation between how you might be involved, overly involved in physical sensations as well. Even though we might not be specifically addressing them right now, we're specifically talking about thoughts. As you see, it's not really even about thoughts. Yeah, but there is there is something important that a lot of times people uh, people mistake good information for receiving reassurance. Hmm. And in order to get to the place where you can not add second fear, you have to actually understand what's going on. So hmm. if you think that your heart palpitations or any other symptom like depersonalization means you're going crazy or that palpitations means you're in physical danger, if you don't understand the pathway between anxiety and or between thoughts and my body is doing this, if you don't get what's actually going on in the body, just being told it's anxiety is of no help whatsoever. Right. You actually have to understand it. So the beginning is like, understanding your body, what it does when it's anxious, why it does that, why it's not dangerous, and so on. That's not reassurance. I mean, it is reassurance, but it's information that that has to happen before you can not add second fear. Right. 
Right. Right. Because, you know, it's just like, what if I'm in danger? That's your second fear until you know, for example, that when you are having a panic attack, your blood pressure is actually going up a little bit, not so much that you would get a stroke, but a little bit instead of down. Down is when you faint, up is when you feel fainty mm-hmm. and completely different things. If you don't know that, okay. how are you going to not add second fear? Yeah. So yeah. the information that people seek at the beginning is really, really important and it needs to be really basic. You know, how do right. you get from feeling like you can't breathe? Where does that come from? You, you, if you just say, oh, that's anxiety, you'll be fine. That doesn't right. really help much. And that's such a good point. I was going to say that you make such a good point with that. And, so you know, yeah. and Barry's book, I mean, and Dare really, he does address all those physical things. But like you said, first is information. And once you get the information, then it's about the implementation. I think a lot of people just get stuck in the information mm-hmm. and, try and, and try and convince themselves. No, it's fine. It's just anxiety. See, this is how bodies work. And your blood pressure actually goes up and not down. Still using information as a fight. But information should just be like, we say dare is like 20% information and 80% implementation. So well, once you get the you basics beyond the word implementation, I like the word attitude. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But you can't get to that attitude without the information. Right. And right. that information part is so important because uh, I just came off a call with a lovely client who went with DPDR to, to a psychiatrist and he was listening to her. Then he pulled up his book and said, this is what you have, a mild case of schizophrenia. <laughs> and you already feel like you're going to, to go insane. And having a professional confirm that, I mean, that can alter the complete course of your recovery. Or this so, is a crazy thought. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. of course, what's mm-hmm. a nice, really good piece of information is that schizophrenia first onset in someone who's 41 does not happen. You know, that it, that the age of onset is in the, the teens and early 20s. And if you're 45 and you're experiencing this symptom for the first time, it's not schizophrenia. Or if it is, please contact me because I want to write that article and we can <laughs> call it the Winston syndrome because it's not, it's not a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And not just that, but uh, I say this always uh, on the calls, you guys. People who become psychotic, um, they tend to show up other symptoms than than hallucinations and grandiose ideas first and much, much more often than these positive symptoms. But people who are anxious, they're fixed on the positive symptoms. Am I seeing something? Am I hearing something? Am I split in two? And some of us have heard that schizophrenia is actually a split personality, which, which it is not, but it has been portrayed like that in movies. So we have these weird ideas about it, but DPDR, it feels like it, but Michelle has this great analogy, just just because fear is high, it doesn't mean that danger is high. Right? It feels like that, but it is not. And more so, I think all other uh, uh, symptoms of anxiety are, are sensations we are much more familiar with. We know heart palpitations, we know dizziness, we know being nervous and on edge, but feeling detached from ourselves is, is something that is more foreign to us. And that's why it scares us more. But um, anyways, point of it being, I know for most people, DPTR, it's the most unsettling sensation. And many, many people fear that it has something to do with, with their, their sanity, but it has not. It's a sensation from the emotional realm, not the mental. Realm. But there's a mechanism by which that is. It's a change in the percentage of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream. It's a real thing. It's just not craziness. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. Oh, we should write a daily dare in that. There you go. Oh, maybe you can write some of our daily dares. We'll, uh, we'll post them in our app. That would be great. Um, so let's go through some of these questions before all 124 people start yelling at us. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I marked off, Aida, do you have some mark? Because I printed out the ones and marked off the thought related ones. I, I haven't marked any of I have them here. Um, okay. So you want me to just read them? Please. I think after this, all of this talk, I feel like even everybody in the chat will kind of be able to see how all these answers are going to be. That's why I kind of like talking first and then asking questions because you're going to kind of 
we kind of probably pre-answer them all. Okay, so here's, here's one. I have existential anxiety with intrusive thoughts alongside DPDR. My question is, should I answer the question myself? For example, yes, you feel detached. This is just anxiety, et cetera. Or do I leave the thought alone, but just acknowledge it without answering back? Submitted by Amy. Amy, if you're on, you can pop on in the chat. Um, I, I know we, we kind of answered pretty much all these, but I want to make sure they're read out loud so you can see the, the questions that come in and how they've been oh, there answered. She is. Hi, Amy. Oh, cool. Hi. <laughs> so, Dr. Winston, any, I mean, we kind of already, we didn't specifically okay. talk so about Again, the, the anxiety, answer but. back is the, is, is trying to apply a technique to fix it. Mm -hmm. So, so being willing to have weird thoughts and not making them mean anything worth responding to is that attitude shift. Um, once we notice some existential issue, like it's possible we're all in the matrix, you can't pretend that you haven't thought that. So that thought will come up, but it can be greeted with amusement or curiosity. It doesn't mean anything that has to be dealt with. And it will, it, it recedes when it doesn't matter. So addressing it with you know, trying to answer it is, is trying to, it, it, when people do that, they're almost always in the mode of trying to apply a technique mm -hmm. so that I would refrain from that. It's anything can be on the crazy channel. It's fine. You know, if you, if you wake up in the morning and your house has just developed this bizarre thing where there's a room an extra room in your house. And you go into the room and there's, what it is is a, there's a large screen TV that's stuck on the wall. And, and, there's, there, and it's stuck on the, on the ridiculous channel or the oppression <laughs> channel or the existential channel. What if this isn't real channel? That is gonna be going on. Now, there's, there's no buttons, there's no remote, it's plugged into the wall, it's too heavy to move, it's on. There's nothing you can do about it. So you have two choices. You can go in the next room and let it be on and do the dishes, or you can keep running back and forth to hope, hope it's turned itself off and it hasn't. Mm -hmm. And you can spend all day checking on this TV, which is still there, still on, or you can go about your day and when it's quiet, well, you can kind of hear it muttering over there. And when it isn't, you don't hear it so much. But if you keep checking on it, you make a miserable day. Yeah. And, and this is so, how we have so to in line. to our minds. There's an extra thing going on. It doesn't matter. And I also, um, that's wonderful, uh, doc, Dr. Sally. And also guys, keep in mind, when you feel detached, you will most likely have thoughts that match that detached, fear. right? Right. When you are in love, you will most likely have happy thoughts, right? Your your, your thoughts are, are colored by your feelings a lot, not only but a lot. So when you do happen to go through a phase of, of DPDR, expect to have strange thoughts. Don't expect to have calming and grounding and great thoughts, right? They match the, your current situation and your feeling. And the same way you you can trust that when you feel when you felt good and in love. You had great thoughts you will get to that place again as soon as this feeling subsides so but i'm really trying to say don't take them seriously it's normal they are supposed to be negative and weird at the moment mm -hmm. yeah we used a similar approach with your tv analogy on the dare advance call last week but instead of a tv we use movie screens and you're in a movie and there's 17 movie screens playing and the same ones on repeat this person just happens to have a lot of doubt and self-negative talk and it's never going to get over. I'm like, just expect that movie to be playing on repeat. And as soon as it ends, it starts over again. But when you, when you zoom in and focus and that's all you see, but you have to remember there's other movies playing too. So when you zoom out, you give yourself a chance to go back to notice mode and then you direct your focus, right? So I can still sit and watch that movie or I can get myself involved in this movie while this movie keeps playing. That's the kicker, guys. This movie doesn't have to turn off. 
you stop noticing it by accident. Like you accidentally become tuned out of something. It's not a direct process and you become tuned out of something when it becomes unimportant. Well, and it, you could you can think about the mind as being broadband, you know, <laughs> and we all have a lot of junk channels that are on all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the do I have to pee channel, it's on all the time. Oh yeah, mine's always on. <laughs> but you check in on it when you're about to leave the house or when mm-hmm. you're about to do a webinar, you check <laughs> in, you know, but it's on all the time. If you check in on it, it'll be on. Yeah. And then if you start worrying, you know, will I be able to find a bathroom? Then you start checking in on it all the time. And then you start thinking you have a problem. Right. And, but, but there are thousands of channels like that, that are on all the time. If you, if you watch them. Right. Right. Okay. So here's another one. That's just like the last one, but I want to say it out loud. So you guys can see like the questions were asked and they're answered. They're very similar though. I, Slightly similar, a little bit of of a difference here. I have daily intrusive thoughts on physically hurting myself, yet I've never done it. The thoughts make me afraid of myself and the possible capabilities I might have. Super common. We talk about this all the time here. It makes it hard to fully, it makes it hard to fully enjoy life. I know, I know how I should address them according to the DARE method, but it's hard to do so in the moment. And after they pass, I'm filled with anxiety and derealization. How do I get over them? Victoria. Victoria, if you're on, just pop on and say hi. Um, If not, um, you'll see the recording. And I'm sure there's plenty of other people that have a very similar experience that will be answering a lot of questions at the same time. So a a lot of what the problem is, is that you're, you're reading and trying to convince yourself that these thoughts don't matter. And you actually do think they matter. You're still believing that the content of your thoughts is something that is meaningful and needs to be addressed. And you're being hijacked by your own imagination. And one of, one of the problems with, um, w- with what you're saying is that you're making an inference from the fact that this shot, the thought shows up, you're making a false inference, which is somehow that means that either you're suicidal or that you're in danger of doing something against your own wishes. And that conclusion that you're drawing means that your relationship to the thought is that you're still hijacked by your own imagination. So you don't actually believe it. You're saying you're, you've got the words, but you don't got the music. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got the, the essence of what you're supposed to think, but you actually don't believe it. And that's where, if you don't believe it, that's where the problem comes in because you can apply all the rest of it and it's just effort, 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 check, check, check. It doesn't- Dr. Sally, how can- How do I believe it? That's gonna be the follow-up question, yeah. How do I believe it? I'm trying to believe it and I just don't. Uh Uh-huh. That that's a really, really difficult one. (laughs) It's, it, it is at some point, it's a leap of faith because you cannot have a hundred percent guarantee about anything. But let me give you a moment in reality that might make you understand what that surrender really is. You know, that game that you, that you can play where everybody's in a circle and one person has to fall back and everybody oh, trust fall. Mm-hmm. There's a moment in which right before you let go that you have to just have faith that they're going to catch you. And that's why that's such an important group project to do in, in groups that are learning to trust each other. And there's a moment in getting the understanding that the, that these are thoughts and that that's all they are, that requires that moment, that leap of faith, that moment in which you say, I give up, I surrender, I'm just going to allow trust to be there and do it. And in that moment, that's what we're talking about. It, people call it letting go, people call it surrender, people call it giving up. But it's where the struggle is just abandoned. Right. And you haven't done that yet. And that's why you're still suffering. And I, can I add one thing? Yeah. It's, what would you say? And the, the, so you let go. And remember, you're, it's always letting go in the midst of uncertainty. 
we tend to, I'll let go and I'm certain, but usually letting go, you grow trust, trust and doubt grow only in uncertainty, right? So they'll always, you can always have trust and doubt present. It's just, I have to, I, we tend to have people that let go when it's certain, but when there's uncertainty, letting go grows trust. Right. The opposite of doubt is not certainty. It's mm-hmm. trust. Yes. That's one of, one of our daily dares is the opposite of anxiety is not calm. The opposite of anxiety is trust. Right. Right. And, and, it, and, and it's, you do it in little bits. And then the minute you take that leap of faith, you take it back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's a, it's a matter of what Claire Weeks used to call glimpsing. And when you, when you glimpse acceptance or surrender, it, 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 the, the moment that you notice that you've glimpsed and you suddenly feel better, then you go, oh, what did I do? I have to figure out how I did that. Mm-hmm. And you, mm-hmm. Right? So it's just something that you get in little tiny glimpses and then you lose it right away. And that's part of the learning process right. is that you then surrender again later on and you build up your capacity to let go and, and trust. But it's, it, you know, that's the, that's the step you haven't taken and why nothing else is working. Notice you didn't even address existential questions. Notice the content of the thought wasn't even addressed, right? Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that? We weren't talking about existential thoughts and getting reassurance and certainty. It was how I treated that thought that happened to have the context of existential thoughts. All right. So, okay. So um, there's actually two very similar questions here. One specifically says for Dr. Winston, for someone with OCD, can I still implement the DARE program steps? Are there certain modifications, same technique approach, certain modifications I should make that I have OCD to make it for more effective from Patrick and another almost exactly the same one. Can you talk about the connection between OCD and anxiety and how treatments for each can vary submitted by Dave? So uh, one's relationship to your mind is the key here. Um, when, what I'd like to say is something that is somewhat controversial. It's a position I've had for a very long time, but not everybody agrees with me. I think generalized anxiety disorder is almost always OCD light. Mm. OCD light. Like Bud and Bud Light, right? Because generalized anxiety is the same process. There's a what if, and then there's a ruminate. And in OCD, there's an intrusion of a thought, and then there's a compulsion. It's basically the same thing, except in generalized anxiety, it's stuff that kind of makes sense. And in OCD, it's stuff that's sort of more strange. But there isn't any clean line between generalized anxiety and OCD because the process is the same Mm -hmm. thing. The the issue is not what are the thoughts and what's the content of the thoughts. It's the functional relationship between the anxiety producing and the attempt to make the anxiety reduce. That circle exists in both. So to some extent, um, uh, most of the generalized anxiety compulsions are cognitive. They're in your head. They don't show. And in OCD, most of the compulsions are also cognitive and they don't show. But there is also the addition of some behavioral compulsions that makes that makes people who aren't in the know say, oh, that's OCD. So you're doing the thing with the light switch over and over, that's mm-hmm. OCD. Yeah. But actually most compulsions in OCD are cognitive compulsions. Yeah. Um, there and are behavioral is, ones. So um, glad to hear you give that answer. Yeah, so, so actually I think it's a continuum. And I, I think um, what you will see in the general literature is exposure and response prevention as the treatment, the gold standard for treatment of OCD. That's what this is with the twist of understanding that the response you're preventing is the engagement and the rumination and the pushing away of 
the, it's the reaction to the anxiety producing or disgust produced or shame produced or guilt produced. In you know, in OCD, it's not just anxiety. It's not just fear. It's all kinds of other things too, but it's the same pattern. And so the same thing applies. Um, if you're doing ERP formally um, and your attitude is wrong, it won't work. Yes, yes. And if I just may point out, we have an example here. So Malin wrote, I'm now stuck in that story about the psychiatrist. I assume the one I mentioned, that is the most scary shit I've ever heard in like forever. <laughs> My complete nightmare right here. So now compulsively trying to reassure myself that this, she doesn't have schizophrenia. Malin, right? girl, are you listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that, right? <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> take to heart, you, <laughs> take to heart what we're talking about for, for over an hour. Allow the thought to be there. Allow the distress signal to be there. But don't try to convince yourself that you're not schizophrenic. Because <laughs> there, there's the O and the C. And the O and the C. And an O. And, and an O. o. <laughs> which means let the thought be there and leave it alone. Because it's unimportant. Not because I have to leave it alone of like, I can have a thought I don't like, and I can also feel uncomfortable about the thought I don't like. I don't have to do anything about thoughts. I don't have to do anything about discomfort either. Yeah, one of, one of the things that, that happens all the time is that when you hear something that's scary, you get that whoosh. Mm -hmm. and the whoosh makes you think it's important. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, why would you have a whoosh for something that isn't important? Mm -hmm. Well, because that's just the way it works. Right. That's but how wishes whoosh, feel. The whoosh makes you think that now you have to pay it. Real. Time. Yeah. Now, that, that, now it's real. You know, Molly, my favorite response to thoughts like this is always and forever. Yeah, that could mm -hmm. be true. Yep. Yep. That Maybe. Could be. Maybe. <laughs> what if you're Maybe. schizophrenic? Well, actually, uh, you know, that I'm not so convinced is necessarily the right way to go. I know that that not is the stand, that standard practice is to oh, is to sort of reinforce the idea that you can't be certain about anything. But mm -hmm. the fact is that there's there's two ways of knowing stuff. Mm -hmm. One is just your common sense, like uh, the the thing that I'm calling wise mind. Yes, right. it's absolutely true. You can't have a hundred percent guarantee about anything. Not, not even that we're all awake right now. You, you know, I could be in a dream, having a very vivid dream about doing a webinar. We can't be sure of anything. I can't be sure that if I go in the next room and I sit down that that chair isn't gonna collapse. I can't be sure about anything. So in that sense, I agree. But there is also a core trust of your, of your, of your common sense, of your, of your, your wise mind, where you, you actually know <laughs> you actually know you, you, but then if you try to convince yourself that you have to have no doubts, right. 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 So I, I feel pretty sure. I mean, feeling sure is a feeling. It's not a fact, right? Mm -hmm. You only, you feel sure or you don't feel sure. I don't say what I say to my friend, meet you at the corner for coffee. I don't say provided I don't have an aneurysm, <laughs> now and then. but I can't be sure. Right. But my common sense tells me I'm likely to make it to the corner. <clears throat> and I think what happens is that when you get those whooshes and you get the doubts that, that come along with this, you start thinking that those are important. Those doubts have to be addressed. And that's where you get stuck. So that, you know, I would, I would turn people towards their own wise minds and their willingness to know what they know, even if it's only 10% feeling of knowing, mm -hmm. and then to allow the doubts to be there right. and proceed in. So that, that tends to be how we use those, like, because I'll find the opposite too. People that get stuck in logic and nope, the science says this, and this is this, and I'm sure it's most likely not going to happen. And these are, but used as a reassurance sort of way. And that whole, maybe it's more like, we tend to use it more of like a dismissive, like, mm -hmm. yup, absolutely. It might happen, but it takes two seconds of my time. And then I kind of just carry on well, as, it, to like leave weird. doubt alone. 
it's it's left out alone. It's yeah. don't you know don't get involved. It's not that you have to accept uncertainty because right, right, right. that then becomes. But how could I accept that I could murder my baby or you know mm. you can't accept the idea that right. you're a pedophile or, you right, know, right. or you're schizophrenic. That's not the point. The point is to not engage with the thought in such a way that it 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 makes the thought important. And it wasn't important. It yeah. felt important because it got a whoosh. Right. Right. And here's. Also, he, sorry, Michelle. So um, saying, yeah, that might happen is just meant to show, look, thought, I'm not impressed by that idea. Right. I'm not impressed. You, right. you must be better than When this. thoughts don't matter. When yes. thoughts and don't matter. That's irrelevance, right? That's the biggest word, the most important word, if you can just remember one thing irrelevance. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And that kind of segues into this similar area of like health anxiety here. So I have two questions about health anxiety. One literally just says intrusive thoughts of health anxiety, how to manage from Marissa, if you're on, um, and health anxiety, how to stop ruminating and actually dismiss doubts from Chloe. Again, the same thing, like you were saying. I, I don't want to murder people. I don't want to have usually health anxiety is you right now worrying about an idea of something that could happen in the future. And it's this, the, the same approach. Um, but since we didn't specifically talk about health anxiety, which probably ties into your anticipatory, um, trying to do a lot to try and prevent myself. Are you sure yeah. is it cancer? Am I going to die? Um, just to have it a little more geared towards well, health anxiety. It, yeah, no, there's many different kinds of health anxiety. One is, is this spot on my arm cancer? And do I have cancer now? And I am responsible for saving my whole, whole, whole life. So I better go check. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, do I have it now? You know, does my problem breathing really mean I'm going to have a pulmonary embolism and die? Or, you know, that sort of responsibility to not miss something. Um, that's a different thing from could this from, you know, in the future, how can I make sure that I don't, mm -hmm. which is impossible, of course, any make sure, as soon as you say make sure you're make sure. on the wrong track, but get rid of my anxiety. There was something in the, in the question that suggested that you, you had to not have the doubts. And that's, that's just not an option. Doubts are normal. And it's the, it's the issue of, are they going to run your life? Or are they just going to be there somewhere in the background, not running your life? Um, um, and again, with health anxiety, you need what I, what I will usually recommend is one reasonable reassurance from a credible medical source. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all you get. Because <laughs> that's after, it. after that, Dr. Google is going to mess up your life. So, so a lot of what the work with health anxiety is actually preventing all the convulsions. Because it, the more you Google, the more you scare yourself, the more you get involved with it, the more you, the more you seek reassurance, the worse it gets. That's mm -hmm. the green book that everybody with health anxiety needs to read. Um, but it, it, it's a story, right? With all the compulsions in which you're trying to make the doubts go away. That's right. needing to know for sure, right? right. So for everybody, health anxiety, uh, get, get the book needing to know for sure. And we are sure about that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely get that one. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, may I throw in a question? Um, it has come up in, in the chat a, a few times. I don't know if it's in, in the forum. Dr. Winston, what about a sensory motor OCD? There's not a lot of stuff out there and we don't have too many people suffering from it, but a few. Oh, and we do. We definitely more, do. More yeah. of the... So that's a, that's a <laughs> hyper awareness of ordinary stuff mm -hmm. um, um, that comes from suddenly focusing on something and wondering if it's, if it's the way it should be, or if it's right. So that the most common are focusing on your heartbeat and also on your breathing, but it could be is, is do I have the right amount of saliva in my mouth? Try Just to... had that conversation right before this webinar. Exactly <laughs> that conversation. The saliva one. Yes. Yeah. Or, or is my, is my eye contact right? Or, you know, do I, have my hands? Pee? do I have to pee? Do I have to pee? Is my, are my lips dry? And then you get this sort of chapstick mm -hmm. 
addiction, blinking, tinnitus, right? Eye float, all the stuff that you kind of like are noticeable. But most often what happens is a person just notices something and then starts wondering if it's right. Mm-hmm. And it feels not right. And then you, the more you try to check to see if it is right, you may actually make it not right. Like mm-hmm. checking to see if you're swallowing right, you can end up making it hard to swallow because the more you swallow fast, 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 check, 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 the harder it is to swallow. That's just your natural body's reaction to that. So it all has to do with being willing to be uncomfortable and not do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And again, it's the same answer over and over and over again mm-hmm. in some ways, but that hyper awareness doesn't just go away. It, it does return. It can either be the centrality of your existence and a big fight you're in all the time, or it can be that sometimes I hear a noise that's annoying, or sometimes I have, you know, I have sensations that I don't like to have. But the issue of I must make it right, I must make it go away, I have to stop thinking about my breathing. The stopping thinking about your breathing happens passively when you when you don't check on it all the time. It doesn't happen actively by insisting on not thinking mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we say there's an on button, but there's no off button. It You can turn it on and then it turns itself off. <laughs> And sometimes it might be on all day. And, you know, maybe when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check to see whether or not it's there. It might be there. But again, that's not that you're doing anything wrong or that you have to do anything except let more time pass. Yes, which actually is exactly what the, this question here is about checking. Any tips to stop checking for intrusive thoughts would be appreciated because it's so clear that checking is what keeps them coming from Dina. Like it's almost the same as a sensory, like you're fine. If you want to go find a thought in your brain, you're going to go find one. <laughs> right. Well, it, 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 if your attitude is, it doesn't matter whether it's there or not, the urge to check reduces, right? right? If you're checking on it because it matters whether it's there or not, then the checking will continue. But if you really, really have adopted the idea that it doesn't matter that channel is on or not, it's probably on, who cares? Then there's no need to check it. So it's the power behind the checking that we're trying to get at, not the checking itself. Right. Um, right. Always and- checking in is a sign of your low willingness. Right? Exactly. If you're not willing, you will check in. If you're not willing, your control will be high. And when control is high, anxiety is high because you can't control it. And the fail of control is what causes this extreme anxiety. So. When you increase willingness, meaning you say, this door is open for your dear thoughts day and night. Please mm-hmm. visit me. You don't have a need to say, oh, did it come in yet? Is it there yet? Is it knocking on my door yet? Right? So there's, the a wa- there's a wonderful act metaphor that I love to use about the bum at the party. Are you aware of this? Oh, yes. I've seen a little video clip of that too. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, you're giving a big party. And it's a it's an expensive party and it's important to you. It's your birthday and you've invited all the important people in your life and it's really exciting. And you've spent a lot of money on the food, especially the shrimp, which are fabulous. Mm. <laughs> and you're having this party, you're having a good time. And then you notice there's somebody standing at the buffet that you don't recognize, that you didn't invite. He's wearing like an old raincoat He's taking a lot of shrimp and some of them he's putting in his pocket. And who is that guy? So you have two choices now. You can have the party in which the police came to take away someone. And that's what people remember about the party. Or you can have a big fight and tell him to go away and then stand in the door and make sure that he doesn't come back and miss your party. Or you can let him take some shrimp and have a good party. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> and, and it's really, you, you know, there's, there's stuff that happens in our minds that we don't like. And we can either make that take over or not. Right. And that's a choice. Yeah. Which it's funny, you're like segueing right into the next questions. Goes right into how do we know when an intrusive thought is no longer an intrusive thought? And it's the same, this, that same analogy of the person at the party. Like my response would be, 
when you give a permission to be there. Well, how do you not- know? How do you know it's an intrusive thought or an unwanted intrusive thought? That's the that's the important word here. the The issue is never what the thought is about. Is about it's how the thought feels and acts. Right. It's not. It's not the content of the thought. Mm-hmm. It's the feeling of the thought. And we all know the difference immediately. It's not something you have to think about and try to decide. It just feels Mm -hmm. wanted or unwanted. That's all. It's, it's, you know, the all of this is extremely simple. It's not easy. Oh my gosh, you you have to be part of our dare crew because it's like Mm -hmm. just seeing another replica of all the things we say here, all... Who all these participants who have you've heard us talk so much? Is it kind of like I feel like I stole all your words and I use them, but this is the second time we've ever spoken. Mm-hmm. It's like we it's simple, but it's not easy, which is why it becomes frustrating because people think simple is easy. But you know, like learning the alphabet backwards, it's simple, but it's not easy because you know it's a well-worn habit. Mm-hmm. And you know, you guys, I get weird thoughts that some people would might consider intrusive for example every time without exception when i see my dog and a knife like when i look at at a certain corner of my kitchen and i do see i notice the big knife and the dog at the same time my mind will go there like yeah. oh that would be a mess <laughs> right? imagine imagine right imagine um, but the the automated response is oh that would be a mess to clean up Right. And you move on. You laugh about it. You make it sarcastic. It doesn't come with that. Oh, my God, that might be true. That might happen. But I've had these thoughts many times where it has caused me great distress when I was going through anxiety. Mm -hmm. But now I can have it and not have that distress with it. So that's also a sign when it, it moves from being unwanted intrusive to I don't care intrusive. Right. That makes sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, just to point that out too, that, that will warrant a phone call from people too, of like, I was having all these thoughts and I was so, so, so scared. And then the scared started to go away, but I still was having those thoughts and not being scared made me scared because you, I thought, that, that what, if, <laughs> what if that means now I do want to do that? And it was the fear that was preventing me from doing all these things to begin with. I'm like, you're still viewing, you're still hooked on the same mm-hmm. thing as the problem. The, the thought is not the problem. It's, well, that, yeah, that's the, the thought that the thing that I talked about earlier of a meta thought. Right, right. I, it's a it's a worry about a worry. Like if I if I don't, if I do all this, then I can have bad thoughts. And yes, but what if this wasn't the right thing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. what if what if I really should pay attention to those thoughts because I'm actually out of control right. or could be out of control? And that's just another thought. And then you can have that thought. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Anything else here? Um, or anything that, that you want to mention that maybe we didn't bring up? As you see, like, as everybody in the chat sees, it's a lot of repetition. And maybe things are slightly geared towards health anxiety or geared towards something else. But you see, it's always going to be the same approach. Even when we talked about sleep with Dr. Nishi last time. We didn't talk about sleep. We talked about how you treat sleep. Dr. Gupta is going to be the same sort of conversation next month. It's going to be how you treat your heart, your stories about your heart. Um, so I just want to make sure we got everything. Um, it's it's yeah, all yeah. the same. Yeah, I, I have one. It, um, I think we have uh, answered this a few times, but uh, it's been um, asked again. Dr. Sally, can intrusive thoughts be about the past as well as the future? Yeah, <laughs> or- uh, you could have either memories of real things that that happened, or you could have the what if thought about what if I did something and I don't remember, or mm-hmm. it had an outcome I don't know about, or something could have happened that, you know, that I that that was bad and I ne- need to find out. Um, so absolutely, it can be things about the past, but almost always it's about the effect of those things on the future, sure. mm-hmm. right? 
So, but absolutely it can be either imagined or real stuff that happened in the past. Um, again, it's, it's, it's about the feel of the thought and the way the thought acts. Okay. And either way, they're all present thoughts, right? They're present thoughts that may take place in the future and they're present thoughts that may take, uh, may take place in the future and present thoughts that may, the content might take place in the past, but they're still present thoughts and present thoughts are in danger. So no matter of like how, like what the storyline is, like a book is a book. And so it doesn't matter if it, it happened before or it, it, it could happen. It's all about if I'm doing a lot of this, from doing a lot of this while those thoughts pop up. But you, you often see a, a pattern where somebody did something that they regret mm -hmm. and they can't get over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, not being able to get over it is happening in the present. It's not right. Right. So it's the same point that you're making, Michelle. Um, and and that is about trying to not have feelings that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, will reinforce them. Right. And trying to forget about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> trying to forget about it. So Dr. Sally, there's, there's, one, there's one corner uh, in, in not too far from my house where I, I made a stupid fender bender about 30 years ago. I never cross that corner without having that pop up into my mind. It's hilarious. <laughs> Every once in a while, I think I actually have passed it and I haven't noticed the thought, but it's just stuck. It's a, it's a, it's a, a association that's highly conditioned. It's mm -hmm. going to pop up. And, and your reaction, just as I'm talking here, is it's funny. It's, it's just funny. It doesn't and you expect it now, right? Now you expect it. Same thing right. happened to me driving my children to a uh, camp. I got bumped from behind. And yeah. then when I went back to, it was not a big emergency, but it rang my bells. And on the next route to pick them back up, I'm mm -hmm. in this heightened state. And I didn't quite know. I was in the same spot. I was in the same spot. And it's almost and like, I, and again, it wasn't, I know why it stuck. It's not because it was a fender bender. It was because it was a stupid fender bender. And I was completely <laughs> humiliated. And it was the kind of humiliation I didn't want to have. Not the car accident. <laughs> that is so fun. Awesome. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Dr. Sally, sorry, Michelle, may I, may I ask? Dr. Sally, it's not a question that came up anywhere, but I think it would be a great question. What can, do you have a, advice for parents if they notice this OCD-ish tendencies in in their younger children let's say before 16 where it's really hard to convey those concepts to them well there's certainly treatment for ocd for kids um, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is a lot more behavioral and less cognitive a lot more um, um, uh, play um, that involves being willing to have the thoughts but it's not as explicit explicit mm -hmm. in terms of uh the, the sort of sophisticated uh, nuances that we're talking about for adults in terms of their relationship to their thoughts. Um, the first thing to do is to see if it can just be modified by play. You know, if a kid is, you know, freaked out about bugs, then go play bug games and, you know, see if you can do more approach than recoil. You also need to allow kids to be uncomfortable. If you're, if you're trying to protect children from having bad feelings uh, all the time, then you're going to end up making them much more vulnerable. They need to develop a willingness to be upset. Um, but if it really keeps going, and especially if you yourself know you have a sticky mind or someone else who's genetically related to that child has a sticky mind, it, you know, it's very likely that what you're picking up is in fact the beginning of OCD. And um, that's, that can be easily dealt with uh, in the early stages by just a shift in attitude. Um, by, by being willing to, um, you know, eat the pretzel off the floor by, <laughs> by being willing to, uh, to, you know, have a bad thoughts contest by laughing together about doing it. And if that, if, if you don't get anywhere with that, then there are people who treat pediatric OCD and they know what they're doing. They're Can also just love for this to be taught in school, like the basics. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. You clicked yeah. that. There's some good um, books for little kids. Um, if you want to look at the books by Don Hubner, H-U-B-N-E-R, or the books by Aureen um, um, Pinto Wagner, 
or Tamar Chansky, I think, she, well, I'm not sure she's got a book actually for kids, but there are lots of books for kids that you can read with them that, you know, I think What to Do When Your Mind Gets Stuck is a lovely one by Don Hubner. There's also um, for teenagers and preteens even, um, Stuff That Sucks by Lisa Coyne <laughs> is just a wonderful book. Um, so that's a, that's C-O-Y-N-E, that's Stuff That Sucks. Uh, but, though, you know, there's, you know, you start with the sort of simple kind of attitudinal shift. And if that doesn't quite do it, then maybe some of the books. And then if that doesn't do it, then maybe go see somebody who treats pediatric OCD. But and here's, they, they would have been taught that in school, like right, I mean, like just a regular taught. approach. It's like, of it. oh, most I would love to see that. <laughs> like, hey, these are thoughts, and sometimes we like them, and sometimes we don't yeah. like them, and sometimes they pop up, and and you know, we kind of normalize the process rather than oh, I don't like this is a problem. I need to go quietly talk to somebody. Um, it would just love to see a shift yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, and actually the very last question that just popped up in the chat, I don't know if that's something you ever addressed Dr. Winston. Do you talk, are you comfortable talking about medication and this process and people that are on it or not on it and the associations with it? Um, I it can comes talk up all about the time. it. I need to do the usual thing. The doctor is, I'm a, not a medical. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I'm not a medical <laughs> doctor. I actually know a great deal about medication. Um, um, uh, Basically, one of the maintaining factors in anxiety and in OCD are, is a sticky mind, and a sticky mind is is a is is inherited. <laughs> you know, there's probably about seventy percent of stickiness is 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 inherited. Thank so, you, mom. <laughs> your mom, your your grandmother, your cousin, somebody else in your family. If if you can't figure out who else is sticky, then then look for the person who drinks too much because it's there. But, um, but yes, medication can be enormously helpful. What medication does is it makes your mind less sticky. That's all it does. Mm -hmm. So if you're depressed, and you're having depressive thoughts, then it makes those thoughts less sticky. If you're anxious, and you're, and you're and, and your sticky, anxious thoughts get less sticky. If you're, um, and, and if you have OCD, it just makes it less sticky. So it makes it easier to do all this stuff. And um, I, I always tell this story, this will date me of course, but this was within weeks of when Prozac was uh, on the market in the United States. Um, and I had a patient who had OCD who was really, really, really struggling. She had harm OCD. She was always, she always had the thought that she had hurt someone and needed to go back and check mm -hmm. kind of like hit and run OCD yeah. but mm -hmm. all the time. And, um, she took the Prozac and about three weeks later, she came into my office with this look on her face. And she said, she said, I just had the most amazing experience. And I said, what was it? And she said, well, I got on the elevator and I came up one floor and the door opened and there was a person standing there and they didn't get on the elevator and then the door closed and then I came up. And as I was coming up, I had the thought, what if I killed that person? Mm -hmm. And then I had the thought, eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That was 21 days after her first Prozac. <laughs> so that is what medication does. It's very helpful if you can't if you can't get anywhere without it, or if you're significantly depressed, then um, then we definitely do recommend that people start on medication. I can talk about the particular medications, but I think that's beyond the scope of this uh, of this conversation. And Maybe it will be so helpful. Right? Is Lisa Coin C O Y N E. And so again, it may help get unstuck, and it's but it to help the process of how you treat the thoughts that were stuck, and so used in conjunction with because there's no medication that changes your behavior. No, right. No. It, it might help it, you work on it, your behavior. It makes changes. it possible for the attitudinal shift right. to happen. It makes it possible, particularly sometimes people's OCD um, is is just like rat a tat tat. It's just like so fast and so intense that they can't 
sort of they can't mm -hmm. back, they can't observe it if they can't get into a right. stance where they're watching it or uh, they're standing back from it then the medication will help them be able right. to We'll use this example sometimes of like, instead of me teaching you how to swim in the ocean, I'm teaching you how to swim in a pool, but we're still teaching you how to swim. And so once you learn how to swim, you get better at swimming. And so using conjunction, that that's usually our go-to approach as well. But Dr. Sally, you, you said that there are some, some medication that you, you, you think is more helpful than other ones. Maybe you could, if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, maybe recommend a book or resources because what I get is a lot of clients who are on medication, different medications for a long time, and it's doing absolutely nothing for them. Yeah. So maybe uh, having resources. The, to the first line of medications are those that affect serotonin. So it would be the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's um, Prozac, Luvox, uh, Lexapro, Celexa, all of those that are in that family. Um, the one most commonly given is Zoloft or Sertraline. Um, the ones that are most powerful, like Paxil, work better, but they're also harder to get off of. Um, the ones that are least powerful, uh, like Zoloft, um, have fewer side effects. Um, so those, the choice among those is done by side effect, not by the main effect. They all do pretty much the same thing. Um, in OCD, you have to have doses much higher than you would have in depression. And a lot of times people are underdosed. Um, at the beginning, it doesn't help for a few weeks. And it's often helpful to have a benzodiazepine just to get you onto the medication. Um, when you first start the SSRIs, you may be a little activated for a few days, a little hard to handle. It's nice to know, that's, know that ahead of time. The benzodiazepines are the clonopin, Xanax, Valium, Ativan family. Um, these are drugs that you can develop dependencies and even addictions. So they are not something that you would necessarily wanna have um, at higher doses over a long period of time. And you certainly, you don't, you wanna be careful about alcohol with those because they work with the same receptor sites as alcohol. Mm. So um, what you don't wanna do with the benzo is use it as a PRN or a, as needed medication, because then if you have some anxiety or some anticipation of anxiety and you take a pill and it makes you feel better, you attribute your ability to do that thing to the pill. And then you get more and more dependent yeah. on the pill and you don't learn as well. Your brain doesn't learn as well, doesn't um, form the same conditioned associations on a, on, a, on a benzodiazepine. So there are lots of reasons to be kind of careful about those, but it doesn't mean that take one, you die, or right. take, take it for a little while and you're forever addicted. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the doses make a big difference. If you're taking just a little dose, you're not going to get addicted, but you do want to take it as um, not as a PRN, just as something you take every day. Um, then uh, if those medicines don't help, there are all kinds of adjunctive medicines um, and some supplements that can be helpful that can be added to those medicines. You can add in different neurotransmitters. Uh, for example, Wellbutrin is about dopamine. Effexor is about in the in the higher dose in the higher doses includes some norepinephrine. So you, it's all done. It kind, and sometimes it, several medicines together is what works better. The medicines that are really essential is if you have a mood disorder and an anxiety disorder, then you need to take medicine for the mood disorder, most likely before you're going to do too well with the anxiety. There's a kind of extreme anxiety, which isn't really anxiety, it's agitation that is actually part of a mood disorder. It's not an anxiety problem. It feels like anxiety that never stops and you can't concentrate and you can't think, but it's not really about stuff. It's really a physical agitation and people call it extreme anxiety, but it's actually a symptom of either bipolar disorder or depressive disorder. And that needs a whole different class of medications, mood stabilizers. I could go on and on and on, but <laughs> no, but I think it's great that people are educated and, and can take that information to their physician. Right? Yeah. 
That's yeah, weird. and and let's be clear that a lot of people, uh, you know, don't know how to medicate. A lot of primary care doctors have one medication that they use for everything, usually Zoloft, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that if you need something more sophisticated, you can you can go see a psychiatrist, and then you can go back to your family doctor for all the refills, and you know, once it's stabilized and you've figured out what's the best arrangement. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, new stuff like adding Deplin and a bunch of other things that are that are always happening that can improve the situation, particularly for depression. Great. Great. This was such a great webinar. I hope you enjoyed coming on here. Thank you so much for all the extra time too. Yes. I'm happy to see it. I hope you appreciate this one hour and 40 minutes. We usually only do it 60 minutes, but this was really so special. So Dr. Sally, thank you so, so much. We hope to see you again. And we will link all the links to, to your work um, in, in the app or where can we post that, Michelle? The links? Mm, um, either Indy can post it on the, on the app directly or we'll post it on the Facebook pages on the app page. You'll get all the info and it will be uploaded to, to the app. So you can watch it for a month, I think. Yeah. And then eventually we have video editors that are going to cut up the video and put bits and pieces up on all the social media to spread the word some more. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, three, just, three books. If you haven't read any, you, now you, you now know what to read. Just read this really like right there. <laughs> This, this is it. It is. Well, so and then good. if you read that and you have lots and lots of questions, <laughs> answer <from> this. <laughs> is that, is that how that came about based yeah. on all the feedback from the first book? Exactly. Mm. And so the, they really, they really should be read together. Okay, good. Now we have something to catch up on Michelle. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us to know, to know all you. right there people i hope you found it helpful it will be posted on the app and we will see you all soon okay bye bye everybody <laughs>